James Madison had two children. By his marriage, he acquired a stepson, but he's not important. These children are both over 200 years old, healthy, still marching on, and I want to discuss them this morning in the order in which he sired them. The Constitution coming first, politics as we know it a little bit later. Welcome to the Miller Center Forum. I'm Barbara Perry. I'm a senior fellow here in the Presidential Oral History Program. Our speaker today is Richard Brookheiser. On my very first trip to Washington, D.C., a trip that my parents gave me for my high school graduation present, my mother and I journeyed by boat on the Potomac River to George Washington's Mount Vernon. Two years later, I returned to D.C. for a Capitol Hill internship, and my friends and I made a trip to Monticello. It was July 1976, the nation's bicentennial, and Britain's Queen Elizabeth was visiting Mr. Jefferson's mountaintop home that day, so it was closed to former colonists like myself. At least another decade passed before I made my first pilgrimage to James Madison's Montpelier. As a constitutional law scholar, I even had the honor of speaking there on several occasions. I relate this order of my visits to three founding fathers' historic homes because I suspect it might reflect how others come to know James Madison. That is, a bit late and after being introduced to more charismatic founders. I hope that Richard Brookheiser's 11th book, simply titled James Madison, will remedy this discrepancy. Mr. Brookheiser is the perfect author to bring Madison to life for a 21st century audience. His highly accessible story paints a multi-dimensional portrait of the man labeled the father of the Constitution. In the sparkling prose of Richard Brookheiser, senior editor for the National Review, Madison's personality, yes, he did have one, springs from the page. While he properly recognizes Madison's landmark contributions to American constitutionalism, our nearly two and a quarter centuries old governing document and its Bill of Rights, Mr. Brookheiser situates his subject in early American politics. In so doing, he reveals Madison the politician, one who could scratch backs as well as stab them. Indeed, the book concludes by ascribing to Madison another monument, American politics. And listen to Mr. Brookheiser's elegant and original definition. American politics, he writes, is the behavior that makes constitutionalism work, the ways and means of acquiring, conferring, and rebuking power, the party organizations and partisan media that are the vehicles of interest, ambition, and thought. Politics can be low, sometimes sordid, Mr. Brookheiser says. Much of it has to be endured because that is the way men are. Which leads him to my favorite Madisonian utterance from my favorite Federalist paper number 51. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Mr. Brookheiser's contemporary commentaries on today's political scene and how they are grounded in his vast knowledge of our founding and our founders. His books examine Washington, Hamilton, Governor Morris, the Adams family, as well as William F. Buckley, Jr., with whom Mr. Brookheiser says he had a close, sometimes tumultuous, relationship. In fact, the National Review first published Richard's work when he was only 15, and he went to work for the magazine straight out of Yale in 1977, becoming senior editor just two years later, which I think makes Richard Brookheiser the Mozart of American political commentary. <laughs> I'm sure his remarks today, entitled James Madison's Children, will be music to our ears. Please welcome to the Miller Center Richard Brookheiser, winner of the 2008 National Humanities Medal. Well, thank you, uh, Barbara, for that introduction. Uh, never be precocious. You just can't, you'll never get away from it. Um, James Madison had two children. By his marriage to Dolly Payne Todd, he acquired a stepson, John Payne Todd, who turned out to be kind of a cross both for his mother and his stepfather. But he's not important to history. But Madison's own two proper children are very important to our history. He was father of the Constitution, and he was father of politics. Uh, these children are both over 200 years old, 
uh, healthy, still marching on, and I want to discuss them this morning in the order in which he sired them, the Constitution coming first, politics as we know it a little bit later. Uh, Madison was called the father of the Constitution in his own lifetime, uh, and he's borne the title ever, ever since. And it's not because the Constitution is the Constitution he hoped to get. No one got that Constitution. All of the men who went to Philadelphia in 1787 and all of the men who debated the Constitution during the ratification struggle failed to get something that they wanted. Uh, they all had to make compromises. They all had to live with the result. But the reason Madison is called the father of the Constitution is that he alone was a major player at every stage of its planning, its writing, and its ratification. In 1786, he and Alexander Hamilton hijacked a conference on interstate commerce at Annapolis, Maryland, and they turned it into a call for a national convention to write a constitution the following year. When that convention met in May 1787 in Philadelphia, James Madison, delegate from Virginia, was the first out-of-towner to show up. He attended every session. He spoke more often than any other delegate except for two, James Wilson and Governor Morris, and he kept notes on every motion and every speech that was given. After the Constitution was finished and was submitted to the nation for approval, he led the fight for ratification in the most important state Virginia. Uh, Virginia was then the nation's largest state. At that time, it included what are now West Virginia and Kentucky. It was also the most populous state. Madison had to go head to head with Patrick Henry, who opposed the Constitution, but he managed uh, to beat Henry for all Henry's eloquence and secure a narrow victory in Virginia. He was also a major player in another must have state, which is New York. New York was then uh, not as large as it would soon become, but it was centrally located. If New York was not part of the Union, New England would be separated from the rest of the country. So the Constitution also had to have New York. And there, Madison collaborated with Alexander Hamilton and with John Jay on a propaganda campaign for the Constitution, a series of op-ed pieces in the New York City newspapers, which we now know as the Federalist Papers. Uh, an op-ed piece today is about 750 words. Each Federalist paper is about 2,000 words. They came out at a rate of four a week, sometimes five. One week there were six. And John Jay got rheumatoid arthritis very early on, so most of the burden fell on Hamilton and Madison. Uh, of the 85 papers, Hamilton ended up writing 51. Madison wrote 29, but many of the most important are from Madison's 29. That after the Constitution was ratified and went into effect, Madison became a, a congressman in the first Congress. He was a representative from Virginia, and he led the fight uh, for a Bill of Rights to be added to the Constitution. At, but Madison was not just busy. He was also intellectually creative. And he had, I think, three original ideas which he gave to this process. And I'm going to go over them in the order in which they occurred to him. The first was that big countries are safer for Republican government than small countries. And this is an idea that he comes to Philadelphia with. Uh, he expresses it there at the convention and also in the 10th Federalist, Federalist number 10. And this flew in the face of human experience and of the political theory of the day. Every Republican government that had existed in history, there hadn't been many of them, but all of them had been small countries. They had been city-states or they had been Swiss cantons. They had been little places where everybody essentially knew everybody else and everybody had a first-hand knowledge of all the affairs of the state. And so political theorists concluded that this is the way Republican government had to work. If that was the case, that was bad news for the United States. 
because it was already far larger than a city-state. It stretched from Maine to Georgia. And so if republics had to be small, then maybe we should have stuck with the Articles of Confederation. Maybe we had to be a league of 13 smaller states or more states as the country grew to the West. Madison said no. He said bigger countries are safer for Republican government than small countries. And his argument was that as you brought more people into a country and more diverse interests and more diverse locations, that this very diversity would make it harder for bad men or bad factions to take power. So his argument is that bigger countries are safer for Republican government than smaller countries. His second new argument is that complex systems are better than simple systems. And this, I think, flies in the face of a natural human instinct, something that's simple is easy to understand, easy to comprehend, easy to see how it works. And that's preference people have for governments, for everything else. And once again, Madison said no. Uh, if simplicity was the way to go, that was bad news for the Constitution. Because what had emerged from Philadelphia was quite a contraption. You had a president, you had a Senate that was picked by one means, and a House of Representatives that was picked by another, and you had a judiciary. And these branches of government coexisted with 13 states, and more as, as time would go on. It was, it was a very complex piece of machinery. Madison embraced that complexity. He embraced the gridlock. And in Federalist 51, he gives the climax to his argument for complexity. He says that all these different branches and all the men who fill them will be driven by their own self-interest to keep all the other branches and office holders in line. And his formulation is ambition must be made to counteract ambition. That's what he says in Federalist 51. So he's making the point that the complexity of the Constitution, like the size of the country, is a good thing, not a weakness. His third contribution was to decide that probably a Bill of Rights is a good idea after all. Now, the Philadelphia Convention had not included a Bill of Rights. It didn't even come up. Uh, it wasn't even discussed until September, the home stretch of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, the first man to bring it up was George Mason of Virginia. And he said, it won't take long to write a Bill of Rights. We, we have all the state Bill of Rights. We can just you know, look at them and, and come up with our own list. But uh, by September, all the delegates had been there since May. They were tired. They wanted to go home. Roger Sherman of Connecticut said, the state Bill of Rights will still be in force. Uh, so why do we need to have a national one? And they, they just let it slide. But as the Constitution went out to the country, it became clear that the lack of a Bill of Rights was one of the main objections that the opponents to the Constitution had. And they were very alarmed that this new government would be chipping away at the rights that they already possessed in their states. Now, Madison's view, and he expressed this in a letter uh, to Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was in Paris at the time. He was our minister to Paris. So Matt, he and Madison are, are corresponding while this whole story is, is spinning out. Madison's view was that a Bill of Rights was a paper barrier. And he had that, uh, he came to that view as a result of his own service in the Virginia state government. And he wrote to Jefferson, and, uh, and he said he never saw an occasion where if the legislature wanted to violate the Virginia Bill of Rights, it didn't just go ahead and do it. And his experience was that it was, it was just a piece of paper. But he changed his mind. He changed his mind for two reasons, the influence of, of two people or groups of people. One of them was Baptists in Virginia. Uh, Baptists were a minority religion in the state. Uh, they had first appeared in Virginia in the middle of the 18th century. Virginia was an Anglican colony. It had an established Anglican church. And uh, even after the Revolution, now the Episcopal Church was still 
uh, very socially uh, prominent. And it wasn't such a bad establishment except for Baptists. They were pretty mean to Virginia's Baptists. Uh, there was a case in Culpeper County, which then was next door to Orange County, Madison's own county. Uh, they put Baptist preachers in jail, and, and one of them wrote of his own imprisonment that when I tried to preach the words of my dear Redeemer through the bars of my cell, a jailer put a bench outside and made water in my face. So this wasn't Barchester Towers. This was pretty rough, nasty stuff. And James Madison, as a young man before the Revolution, was enraged by it. It was the first issue that engaged his attention in his early 20s. And he spoke out for Virginia's Baptists. He was not a Baptist himself, by the way. He was, his family was, was Anglican Episcopalian. But uh, his, own, um, his own mind and his own thoughts were so precious to him that he could not endure that other people's thoughts and conclusions could land them in jail and, and in hum scenes of humiliation. So he had been a friend of Virginia's Baptists since the early 1770s. Uh, and they knew that. And they went to him with their worries about the new Constitution. They let him know that they were alarmed that it did not have a Bill of Rights. So he was hearing from them. He was also hearing from his best friend, Thomas Jefferson, his correspondent in Paris. Now, Jefferson uh, was, was eight years older than Madison. Uh, they were, I guess, neighbors, as, as neighborliness is defined in Virginia. It was a half day's ride from <laughs> Montpelier to Monticello. Um, one of the pleasures of writing this book was exploring their relationship. I think, I think Jefferson was the cool older brother Madison never had. Madison was the eldest child in his family. But so here was this eight years older man. Um, Madison maybe was a little smarter, but Jefferson was quirkier. He had a brilliance. He was like a blue jay. He would, he would find bright, shiny objects or thoughts and just pluck them and take them to his nest and keep them there. And I think Madison was, was thrilled by knowing this man and by being his best friend. So he's writing Thomas Jefferson, briefing him on everything that's going on in Annapolis and Philadelphia and the ratification fight. And Jefferson is, is very encouraging to his younger friend. And all his letters, they have the same shape. There's always praise uh, for James Madison and what he's doing. But they always say the only thing this Constitution needs is a Bill of Rights. Uh, he says, in one letter, he says, a Bill of Rights is something that every, every people deserves to have from every government. And he must say this half a dozen times. I think maybe by letter five or six, Madison you know, could probably spot these passages coming and may have <laughs> gritted his teeth. You know, Here I am sweating to make this happen, and you're off in Paris, and you just keep telling me we need a Bill of Rights. But he listened to Jefferson. And the way the thought that he finally came to was that a Bill of Rights, it, it would be more than a paper barrier. By putting it down on paper, it would change people's thoughts and it would change people's habits. It would be in the Constitution as something they become familiar with and something that over time they would come to respect. So Madison turns on the question of the Bill of Rights. And as I said, when he gets into Congress himself in 1789, he makes it his business to put this on the agenda of the House of Representatives. And then the House prompts the Senate to act. Uh, they confer. And they send 12 amendments out to the states. Uh, the original first amendment had to do with the size of congressional delegations. And that, that just fell by the wayside. The original second amendment had to do with congressional pay. That was not ratified until 1992, when it became the 27th amendment. But the original amendments 3 through 12 were ratified fairly rapidly. And they became amendments 1 through 10. And the resemblance of 10 amendments to another famous set of 10 laws makes Madison a secular Moses. 
so if Madison had been run over by a carriage and killed in the fall of 1789, his work as father of the Constitution would be almost done. But he still had a second child coming. And this child begins to be born in 1791. And one of the incitements for the birth of this child is Madison's old friend, Alexander Hamilton. George Washington is the first president. His best friend, Thomas Jefferson, is the first secretary of state. His uh, contemporary and associate, Alexander Hamilton, is the first treasury secretary. Madison is the leading member of the House, not the speaker, but acknowledged to be the first man, as another congressman put it. So this looks like the dream team of American politics, all these political allies at the summits of power. But what starts to drive them apart is Alexander Hamilton and his financial program. The way he decides to service America's debt and the establishment of a National Bank of the United States throw James Madison into deep alarm. Now, Hamilton was a former merchant's clerk from the West Indies. That's where he'd come from. And his first job was being a clerk on a stool in a merchant house. And he thought he was bringing America into a modern financial world. James Madison is a Virginia planter and the son of Virginia planters. And this seems alien to him. It seems like doing favors for Hamilton's speculator cronies. I'm not going to adjudicate that fight this morning. What, what's important to me here now is what Madison does about it. And the first thing he does is he takes a vacation. In the summer of 1791, he and Jefferson leave the capital, which is then Philadelphia, and they go to New York City. Then they go up the Hudson River, they go to Lake George, Lake Champlain, then they hook around through New England and come back south, cross Long Island Sound to Long Island, back to New York City for a while, and then they go back to Philadelphia. And they, they hunt, they shoot squirrels, they fish, they canoe. Jefferson writes a letter to his daughter Polly on a piece of birch bark from a canoe in Lake George. And it's amazing to me how many biographers of Jefferson and Madison accept this cover story. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, different view, the different view we have from a man who was actually on the spot, a lawyer in New York named Robert Troop. And he was a good friend of Alexander Hamilton, also a good friend of Aaron Burr. And he wrote Hamilton, who was in Philadelphia all this time, a warning. He said, there is every sign of a passionate courtship between these two travelers and uh, New York politicians who had their own quarrels with Hamilton, including Senator Aaron Burr. So what was going on? Madison and Jefferson were looking for allies across the country. If they want to slow Hamilton down, if they want to stop him, they can't just do it from Virginia, great though Virginia is. They need allies elsewhere in America. And this trip to New York and New England is the first step in building a national political organization. In 1792, Madison gives it a name. He calls it the Republican Party. And that's the name it will have till the end of the 1820s when it will begin to call itself the Democratic Party, which is the name it still has. It's the oldest political party in the world, except for the Tories in England. The modern Republican Party is a different organization that was founded in the 1850s. So this summer vacation is the first step in building America's first national political party. Madison also realizes a national party needs national media. And for this, he turns to an old college friend of his named Philip Freneau. They'd been to Princeton together, uh, but Freneau has kind of come down in the world since being in college. He's been a, a ship's captain. He's been a privateer. 
Uh, he writes journalism, he writes poetry, his life is not, not so successful. But Madison comes to him with another job. Freneau is to edit a newspaper in Philadelphia in the nation's capital, which will express the views of the Republican Party. He introduces him to Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, who gives him a no-show job at the State Department. So he has a salary and he has access to government documents. And Jefferson says, your duties will be so light, you can do anything you wish in your free time. Well, what they wish him to do is to run this newspaper. Madison sells subscriptions for the newspaper to friends of his in Virginia. He says it will be a source of enlightenment and entertainment. And the National Gazette publishes its first issue on Halloween 1791. And very soon it is thwacking Alexander Hamilton and even President Washington, who is uh, so distressed by this criticism that at one cabinet meeting he refers to that rascal Freneau. Now, the, the National Gazette uh, disappears in 1793 when there's a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia that kills a lot of its readers, but it's replaced by other Republican newspapers. Hamilton himself founds a newspaper in 1801, the New York Evening Post. It's still being printed, minus the evening. And these are the ancestors of Fox and MSNBC and The Nation and The New Republic and National Review and every political or ideological uh, media outlet out there. It begins in the 1790s with the National Gazette. But I think the most important thing maybe that Madison does, and it's a very Madisonian thing, is he reflects on what he's doing and he writes about it. He writes a series of columns, uh, articles, for the National Gazette in 1791 to 1792. And some of these are, most of these are political bumper stickers. Uh, they lay out the platform of the Republican Party for the next 20 years. And they say things like, um, peace is good, war is bad. Farms are good, uh, cities are bad. Um, ordinary people are good, rich people are bad. <laughs> now, Madison and Jefferson are, are rich people, but their wealth comes from land and from owning people, so that's good. But <laughs> Hamilton's friend's wealth comes from, you know, shorting and, you know, buying short and selling long and all these mysterious operations on Wall Street, which has begun, even then, begun to be the symbol of that sort of activity. So th this is what, what Madison is saying in the National Gazette. But his more interesting essays, he has several essays on public opinion. Now, public opinion in 1791 and 1792 is a new concept. Uh, the phrase was first used in France. Madison is one of the first people in the English-speaking world to use that phrase, public opinion. And he advances it now as an extra safeguard for liberty. He's found a new safeguard in addition to the size of the country and the complexity of the government and the Bill of Rights. He, he thinks we need a fourth thing, and that is public opinion. And he defines that as the continual attention of people to political affairs. Now, all the founders, even, even Hamilton, even John Adams, they believed in popular sovereignty and popular rule. But a man like Hamilton thought it, it exercised itself at election time. People would go to the polls, they'd vote, and then the men that they voted for would do their jobs until the next election when they were either reelected or dismissed. And that's the way popular rule worked. It was kind of a cycle. But Madison says, no, it's a continuous thing. He calls for one empire of reason over the whole country. And he says that every citizen must be a sentinel, it's his word, a sentinel over the rights of every other citizen. He's defining a continuous loop 24-7. Public opinion never rests, it never ceases. It always has to be consulted, it always has to be led. He doesn't say this, but it always has to be manipulated. He's foreseeing the world that we now have the world that we now live in, and he's calling it into being. So these are the contributions that he makes uh, in those early days in the 1790s to our political system. 
Now, of course, there, there are some drawbacks to the new political system. I'll just talk about one uh, that, that um, bites Madison himself when he becomes president uh, in 1808, and he's reelected uh, in 1812. And this occurs during the War of 1812, which he asks Congress to declare uh, in June of 1812. And it goes for two and a half years, and he is our commander in chief during that war. And uh, he, he goes to war uh, with, um, uh, with a not very prepared military establishment. Uh, the greatest general to come out of the War of 1812 was a man named Winfield Scott. Uh, he would be a, a heroic general in the Mexican War, and he would last even to the Civil War. He'd come up with the Anaconda Plan, which is how the Union ultimately beat the Confederacy. He's, he's too old to implement it, but it's his plan. So when he's writing his memoirs, he's looking back at the army on the eve of the War of 1812. And he said the officer corps was imbeciles and ignoramuses. Uh, he said the old officers had fallen into habits of intemperate drinking, and the young officers were swaggerers who were fit for nothing else. Now, the president is not responsible for the officer corps but he is responsible for the service secretaries who are responsible for the officer corps. So, so who are they uh, as America goes to war? The Secretary of War is a man named William Eustis. Uh, he's a, a former congressman. He was an army doctor during the Revolution. And he is overwhelmed by administration. He simply cannot do it. One man describes him sitting in his office looking at advertisements to see where he can buy 100 hats and 200 shoes. You don't want the Secretary of War doing that. <laughs> the Secretary of the Navy is a man named Paul Hamilton, a, a former governor of South Carolina, no relation to Alexander. Uh, he's an alcoholic who quits work at noon. So these are the two men with whom Madison is going to take on the greatest superpower on Earth, uh, Great Britain, in June of uh, 1812. And the first six months of the War of 1812 are disastrous. There are victories at sea. That, that's the only bright page. But uh, the British captured Detroit. Uh, we try to invade Canada across the Niagara River. Uh, the New York militia says, well, we, we don't have to serve outside New York. We're not, uh, we're not crossing the river. So that, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work. Um, to Madison's credit, he, he sees what's going wrong, and, and he, he tries to fix it. Uh, he fires uh, these two secretaries. He replaces them with better men. He cleans out the dead wood. And uh, by two years later, there is a battle, uh, again, on the Niagara frontier called Chippewa. And this is the only battle in the War of 1812 where the British and the Americans faced each other with equal numbers on a flat field with no uh, obstacles in between. And uh, as this battle was beginning, uh, the British commander uh, looked at the Americans coming down upon him and said, those are regulars by God. I mean, they weren't, they weren't bumpkins <laughs> anymore. And the Americans chewed the British up at the Battle of Chippewa. Uh, so we had learned. And it's to Madison's credit that we learned. But it's to his discredit that we had to learn such, so steeply. And that is because of taking politics too seriously, of putting incompetence in jobs to which they were unsuited simply because they were good Republicans and good political allies. But it seems to me that uh, it's the best system if you consider the alternatives. If you want to look at some alternatives, look at the news from Egypt. I mean, you can have anarchy, uh, excuse me, you can have stasis for 30 years, you can have Mubarak, uh, and then you can replace them, and you can have anarchy after that with the likelihood of more uh, a stasis following it. So if those are the alternatives, I'll stick with the political system that we have. So Madison, uh, that is one of his legacies. The Constitution is the other one. The Constitution is the rules. Politics is the game. And we should be very grateful for his contributions to both. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Mr. Brookheiser, for that superb talk. And you can see why his book on James Madison is a joy to read. Uh, as you're gathering your thoughts and, and some of you moving to the back of the room, I hope to pose questions. Uh, I will offer uh, the first one to Mr. Brookheiser. And that is, you mentioned in your talk today uh, the role of the Virginia Baptist in uh, pushing Madison towards writing and drafting a Bill of Rights. Uh, could you talk about the religion clauses in the First Amendment, uh, his very own free exercise clause, the establishment clause, and what do you think Madison's views about uh, the Supreme Court, the modern Supreme Court's interpretation uh, of those clauses would be? And do you think he expected this concept of incorporation whereby the court eventually through the 14th Amendment, would apply most of the elements of the Bill of Rights to the states. Well, on the incorporation question, he, he wanted that in the first Bill of Rights. He wanted that explicitly. Uh, when, when he's in the House um, prompting the House to, uh, uh, to write a Bill of Rights that would go out to the states for ratification, uh, one of the suggestions he makes is that there should be an amendment explicitly saying that certain rights, and religion is one of them, I think it's religion, speech, and there's, there's, there's a third one, which I'm forgetting, but he, he wanted it explicitly said that the states could not violate these either. Now, this, this didn't make it out of the House, and it took 150 years for you know, the judiciary to, to ponder this and look at the Civil War amendments and, and you know, try to patch it together that way. But, uh, you know, if Madison had had a free hand, he, he would have done it uh, directly in 1789. Um, you know, what the, one of the issues that uh, preoccupies Madison biographers is his consistency. You know, how consistent was this man? And, you know, they're the people who try and, like, find a way to, like, fit everything he does into some consistent pattern. And I'm not one of those people. I mean, there are... You know, there are just times when he shifts his weight from one leg to the other. He just does. And sometimes he's a, a federal government guy, and then sometimes he's inclining more to the states. I mean, he never quite topples over in one direction or the other, but he does shift his weight. On a few things, though, he is consistent. And one of those was, was religious liberty. Um, He's very cagey about his own religious beliefs. Not like Jefferson. Um, there's no paper trail. There are no thoughts, no speculations. My hunch is that um, whatever faith he'd had, he'd lost. There's a very kind of wintry letter he writes when he's an old man. And someone ha wants him to comment on a on an 18th century book, which was a sort of a, a set of proofs of the Christian religion. And he says, um, all he'll say is that uh, the notion of a, of, a, of a God who was a first cause and a creator is, is one that the mind accepts. I mean, that's, and that's sort of all the farther he'll go. And then he'll say, and perhaps philosophical speculation must stop at this point. And I suspect that's the point at which he himself stopped. But he, he was always, he never lost his youthful uh, outrage at, at uh, what happened to religious minorities under establishments of religion, what was happening to the Baptists in his own neighborhood. And that's one of the issues where he, he, he never blinks or wavers. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I noted in the newspaper last Sunday uh, the top ten nonfiction bestsellers that three are by um, political pundits. Uh, Sean Hannity has one in Washington, Glenn Beck on Lincoln, and Chris Matthews on Kennedy. So I haven't read your book. I'm going to do it very soon. But I wondered if one read your book and then uh, let's say that someone like Rachel Maddow wrote a book on Madison, would someone reading those two think they were reading about two different people? Well, first, I'd like to sell as many books as Sean Hannity and uh, <laughs> the other people as you mentioned. Um, look, uh, today I'm a conservative Republican, but uh, I'm not writing about today. I'm writing about, you know, Madison dies in 1836. 
And uh, in a way, this is a stretch for me. I think of myself as a Federalist, so I've kind of, I've crossed over to the other side. I'm looking at that first Republican Party. But, uh, you know, you have to do that because they prevailed. I mean, the Federalists just, just lost out, uh, partly for bad reasons, partly for being demonized, uh, but also for mistakes they made. Uh, they just made a lot of mistakes, uh, and they suffered the consequences. And, um, you know, Madison was, was one of the big reasons why they lost. You didn't want to fight this guy. I mean, he was, he was only a little over five feet tall and a little over 100 pounds, but the early republic is littered with the bodies of people who <laughs> opposed him. Uh, he, he was very tough, very determined, very wily, and he'd win. So, um, I, you know, I don't know what sort of a book Rachel Maddow or Sean Hannity would write about Madison, but I'm, I'm trying to, you know, to, to, to sort of see things from his point of view, um, try to explain why he did what, what he did. Uh, I do pass judgment on him. Um, I think he had a lot of weaknesses as an executive. Uh, there are some times where he lacked the imagination we wish he would have had. I think his positions on slavery are very disappointing. A real, a real intellectual and moral failure. Uh, it's even worse than Jefferson, uh, because at least Jefferson agonizes, uh, which which Madison doesn't really. So, so that, but but that's the kind of um, that's the kind of approach I'm trying to give. Mr. Burkheiser, thank you again for coming. It was a great talk. I was just wondering if you can comment on what seems to me um, a discrepancy between um, different. Uh, eras where Madison's thought. Um, you talked about how in Federalist 10, during the Federalist arguments, he was an advocate of the idea that um, diversity in just many factions can control, you know, uh, one fact from getting too big and out of hand controlling. And I was wondering how he can then justify his belief in the growth of political parties such as the uh, Republican Party, which, I mean, when you compare that and then the Federalist Party to national parties that seem to control politics, and then eventually after the Hartford Convention when the Federalists die out and you have just a one-party system for an extended period of time, how then those, how then you can justify the idea that you need a lot of factions when you just have these one or two controlling the nation? Well, you know, Madison's job is politics. And, uh, and politics is always sending you new problems. Uh, the, the world never, uh, never stays put, and, and new stuff is always coming up. Um, you know, people have ambition, and so people are, are trying to, to rise up in the political world. Issues are appearing, and, and sometimes they're new, or they're new configurations of old ones. And you just have to, if you're in, if that's what you do, you just have to deal with all these as they come over the horizon. I mean, a scholar has the luxury of, you know, um, teaching classes, writing books, uh, and and sitting in his in his office. But a politician, politician can't do that. So that's how I interpret Madison's inconsistencies. I mean, he's. You know, and he will, in Federalist 10, uh, he's, he's looking at a diversity of factions, and, and he, you know, he sort of wants a maximum number all butting heads. But then, of course, as founder of the Republican Party, he wants the Republican Party to prevail, and it, and it does. The Federalists disappear. He sees them disappear. They disappear in his own lifetime. But uh, in his retirement, uh, Missouri applies for statehood in 1819. And Missouri is the, it's the second state from the Louisiana Purchase to apply for statehood. Louisiana was the first. Now, clearly, Louisiana was going to be a slave state. New Orleans was, a, was an old uh, city of Spanish and French culture. And then you know, slavery was just <coughs> baked into the cake there. So everybody, everybody accepted that. But Missouri looks like tabula rasa. You know, it's, it's relatively unsettled. So what kind of a state is Missouri going to be? And all of a sudden, you get this sectional division on this question. And, and that alarms Madison. So now he's sort of shifting back to Federalist 10 Madison. He's saying, we've got the northern states and the southern states, you know, going at each other in Congress over whether Missouri should be a slave state or a free state. And he talks about these the shocks of these great masses. And so he's sort of shifting back to his Federalist 10 foot. 
and saying, you know, this is the very danger I warned against, that you'd have two uh, forces so compelling that they just try to override each other and everything else. Uh, and um, he can't think of a way around that. I mean, he, he sees what's coming, he fears it, and he sees what's going to happen. But um, all he can suggest is uh, a kind of a falling back on his Federalist 10 self. So, um, but, but this is, uh, you know, this is what politicians do. And, uh, and I do give Madison the credit for having, you know, thought out the world of possible options, you know, pretty thoroughly. And so at least it, 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 there's a certain intellectual clarity of when he's sort of shifting his weight. I mean, he, he knows the ground that he's, he's doing it on. It's not just pure opportunism or impulsive opportunism. It's, I guess I'd call it, intellectual and informed opportunism. <laughs> Mr. Brookheiser, thank you very much for coming. I think we all greatly appreciated your talk. Um, you talked about Madison's views on public opinion as maybe the normal man uh, outside of elections exercising public opinion as an empire of reason and citizens being sentinels for liberty. And then you made an interesting comparison to Egypt today. Uh, and when I, as a student of political science, when I look at where does public opinion actually matter? And I see in Egypt maybe people expressing, average people expressing their opinions and actually maybe making a slight difference in their country. And then I look to the United States and I see maybe the, today the only really active group of average people outside of lobbying that are doing something as people that are sitting on Wall Street and people that are in these Occupy Wall Street movements. So my question is, uh, was Madison's dream of the average man being a sentinel for liberty ever, ever achieved, and if not, why? Well, um, uh, you know, he certainly thought so um, when the Republican Party was victorious. Uh, and, and, you know, let, let me explain what was at stake in his mind. It was, it was more than Hamilton's financial system. It became other things that the Federalists were doing. There was a whole foreign policy component to this dispute, which, um, I could have gone into at equal length. Uh, you, you always have to remember uh, that the first 25 years of America under the Constitution uh, is happening alongside the French Revolution and the wars that grow out of that. Washington is inaugurated president in April 1789, and the Bastille falls in July 1789. And the fall of the Bastille soon sets off over 20 years of world war. It's longer than World War I and World War II put together. And it's as bloody and it's as ideological as the Cold War. And we're a little country. I mean, we're physically big, but we're, we're a little country on the edge of nowhere, basically. And the two superpowers in the world are France and England. And they are in a death struggle. You know, they are just in a death struggle. And, um, and there's an ideological component to it. And, uh, you know, uh, Madison and Jefferson are, are very pro-French, and, and they stick with the French Revolution right through the Reign of Terror, and then right through the Directory. It's only Napoleon makes them back off a little bit, because he's a military adventurer, and they don't like such people. So they, they take a step back. But their, their, their bogeyman all this time is England. I mean, England is the great threat to liberty in their minds. And the Federalists uh, see it in the reverse the reverse uh, way. They, uh, you know, they're, they're appalled by France and, and, you know, the extreme Federalists uh, want to be openly allied with England. Uh, it reaches the point, uh, this is after, you know, after Washington is dead, after Hamilton is dead, that uh, some of the surviving Federalists want to break the country up and they want the northern part of it to ally with England. Um, Governor Morris, draftsman of the Constitution, Madison's colleague uh, in Philadelphia in 1787. You know, he wants New England to pull out of the Union and he wants it to invade New York and pull New York out of the Union if New York won't go. I mean, it doesn't get any more radical than that. You know, forget Occupy Wall Street. He wants a civil war. He wants a civil war. He says, the brethren will say this is a civil war. What of it? I remember a war for liberty. You know, he's talking about the revolution. This is wild stuff. So, uh, so when Madison uh, 
sees his own party beating these guys, you know, he thinks that's a good thing. And he thinks the people have spoken and they have rejected these, these councils of, of desperation. Uh, so he, you know, he would point to his own lifetime as an example of that, uh, of that prevailing. Now, you know, he, he's, he's, not, he's not giving us solutions for all time. He's, he's, he's setting up, he's pointing to certain problems we, we may face, and he's offering us ways to do, deal with them, but we have to seize those ways. And I think you could say that Lincoln is an example of someone making a case to the people, to the people of the North, as to why they had to resist the slave power. And he does it very, very brilliantly. I mean, he, he, he takes from the founders what is most useful to him, and he, he presents that in such a way that he will convince the public of the North that um, this is what we now have to do in order to resist uh, the slave power and the Confederacy. Uh, and it didn't have to work out that way. I mean, it, it really didn't. Uh, so he's an example of a small d democratic politician, you know, sort of using this empire of reason and making people sentinels. But um, I guess what Madison doesn't say in this first essay is that, uh, you know, being a sentinel isn't just something, hello, you just do it. I mean, you, you have to make yourself one. And you have to make yourself a smart sentinel. I guess that's what I would say going back to Egypt. Uh, there are sentinels and sentinels. And, and people get manipulated, and they get used, and, uh, and they get beaten. They get beaten down. You know, you've got to think about that, too. You've got to make those calculations before you put yourself out there. So it's not, it, it's never easy. It's never easy. I want to thank you for this exciting review of our national origins here in Virginia. Uh, I was impressed with the arrogance and audacity of George III when he wouldn't respond to the request then. And uh, his uh, attitude of exceptionalism of the British Empire at that time, that seems to be reflected in our own national politics in the current uh, uh, debates when uh, national exceptionalism is, seems to be a principle which we have adopted or adapted from George III. And I was wondering, uh, I know Shakespeare perhaps said, uh, uh, pride goes before a fall. I think and it, was it the seems Bible. to. Pardon? <laughs> Bible, wasn't it? Well, I was wondering about that. I asked somebody. <laughs> I asked somebody, Does and he someone said have to a Shakespeare, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, being a preacher's son, I'll accept your, okay. your correction. If the Bible said it, I'm sure he stole it. <laughs> it must, <laughs> yeah, and in, in, in the attitude of Jefferson. Uh, but I, I'm concerned about the audacity and arrogance of the debates that I've heard about American exceptionalism. And uh, the human rights bill is a human rights bill, not American rights bill. Our Declaration of Independence is the independence of everyone, not just Americans. And I think, was thinking of our attitude towards torture in this respect. Well, the exceptionalism goes way back. Um, you know, it's, it's very striking to read Madison's notes of the Constitutional Convention and uh, he will record people. Uh, Hamilton says it at one point. Elbridge Gerry says a very similar thing at another point. They're saying, if we fail here in Philadelphia, uh, the cause of liberty will be lost to the world. It will be lost to the world. And you think, well, gee, you, you've got there are like 40 guys uh, meeting in Philadelphia, and it's uh, basically this equivalent of an English provincial town on the edge of the Atlantic. And you know, you go a few miles west, and there's bison and forests. And they're thinking they're going to affect the world. And how crazy is that? And, you know, and, and there are ways in which that, that skepticism is uh, you know, maybe justified. But, but also, to a large extent, uh, uh, they were right. 
I mean, Jerry and Hamilton and all those other men sweating in that room uh, were right, that, that what they would do um, uh, would have effects not just for themselves and their posterity, uh, but, but, for, but, but for the world beyond. So you have to, you know, sometimes people, uh, they, they put themselves out there and they take those risks and uh, those intellectual risks and, and sometimes they actually pan out. Now, you know, to your concern, um, you know, then you have, you have to be true to what you've done. Uh, you know, there's, there's always that. And uh, fears about American exceptionalism are also very old. I mean, John Adams says this repeatedly. He says that, uh, you know, we will, we will go the course of all other countries. We will, we will rise up, we will become great, then we'll become an empire, we'll become decadent, and then we'll fall. I mean, he says words to this effect a lot during, during his lifetime. So that's also a thought um, that the American founders had. And, uh, you know, so part of their, all their thinking and planning and machinating is to see how to, to, to hold off that bad end game as long as they could. And, uh, and you know, that's another thing that Madison and his, his friends and his rivals are, are trying to cope with and, and that we have to cope with. You know, we can't just all leave it in their laps. I mean, they're leaving it in our laps. We have to keep, keep on doing this. How do you think Madison would react to this thesis? That if part of the magic of the Constitution is checks and balances, it is also rife with the potential for a virus what if we get to be mostly checks and almost no balance? The legislature fighting the executive, check. The executive fighting the legislature, check. Within the legislature, nothing gets done, check, check. They even put in, the, the, the Congress does, and uh, uh, filibuster rule, which one matters, and guarantees check. Isn't that where we are? The failure of the checks and balances system. Well, you know, Madison felt pretty checked himself a lot of times, uh, especially when he was president. Um, Jefferson, I think, was a brilliant politician. He was just a, a brilliant nat natural politician, and his, his first term was a, was a glorious success, and he got everything he wanted, everything. And he even got it by not pretending to want it. I mean, that's how, how, how skillful. Uh, and sly he was. Uh, second term was not so good. Uh, Madison had a rough presidency, and he, you know, if he'd heard your question, he would have said, oh, I lived there, I was there. No, I had those checks. And this was from within his own party. I mean, there was a group of senators, they were called the Invisibles. That was a name that, that was given to them. They were very visible to James Madison, and they, they, were, they tormented him. They just tormented him. And partly, they were out for themselves. Um, the, the three were William Branch Giles from Virginia, uh, uh, Samuel Smith from Maryland, and um, Michael Lieb uh, from Pennsylvania. And uh, Giles had wanted to be Secretary of State. And um, Smith wanted his brother, Robert Smith, to be Secretary of State. So Madison, Madison didn't want either of those men Secretary of State. He wanted Albert Gallatin to be Secretary of State. But, you know, he, he figured out very early on it couldn't be Gallatin. It would have to be Giles or Smith. And um, John Randolph of Roanoke, who was a kind of a brilliant, crazy congressman from Virginia, his comment was, well, it should be Smith rather than Giles because Smith can spell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You didn't want to offend John Randolph. He'd, uh, he'd pay you back. So, um, so, so Madison, Madison was quite, quite familiar with checks in his own presidency. And, uh, and certainly um, uh, John Quincy Adams, who uh, James Monroe succeeded Madison as president, and then John Quincy Adams succeeded Monroe. And his whole term was just, just a waste, just a waste. Didn't accomplish anything. And it was all, you know, it was this uh, going on. So this has happened before. And, and uh, you know, Madison saw it. And, and I guess what he would say is live a long time and, you know, and beat, beat the other side. You know, <laughs> just, just do your work. The thing, I, I'll tell you, the thing I, before I began this book, I knew that Madison was smart. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows he's smart. What I didn't realize was how tough this guy was. 
This guy never quit. He never quit. And when he lost, which would happen a fair amount of the time, he would never just sulk. Sometimes he'd sulk, but he'd always be thinking, okay, what now? What next? What do I do next? How do I turn this around? Maybe I can make this not so bad. Or maybe it isn't so bad. Maybe I have to rethink. Maybe there's something here I haven't noticed. And he, he never stops, never. And that's why he wins. That's why he ends up being president for two terms. And other you know, more um, prepossessing people uh, fall by the wayside. Or, like James Monroe, have to wait their turn. So, so that's what he would say, just you know, get in there and work. Do your work. I have a simple question. In light of Those the current toughest one. <laughs> in light of the current dynamics in our current political system between the parties, if James Madison could come in and address a joint uh, House and Senate, what would he say to them about their current dynamics of no and not fair and all this stuff that's going on today? Well, I think he'd say uh, something similar to what I, what I said to the last question, last questioner. I mean, he'd say it, you know, he'd say it differently, and I'm sure better than I did. But um, you know, this is the man who never stops, and he's also. I mean, one reason he never stops is he shares with Jefferson. He's not as poetic about it as, as Jefferson was, but he shares with Jefferson a confidence uh, in the people that you know, if you do your job as a politician and, and really put it to them, uh, at the end of the day, they'll, you know, they'll do the right thing and they'll back you up. Uh, now, now, Jefferson is the bard of such sentiments. Uh, Madison is not a poet. Jefferson was a poet. But I think, uh, I think Madison did share that conviction. And that was one of his, um, in addition to ambition, <laughs> one of his motivators in his persistence and his toughness. So that's what, that's what he would tell us. Our last question will come from our director of the Miller Center, Governor Beliles. Mr. Burkheiser, thank you for coming to the Miller Center. Uh, I'm confident that your book will do much to uh, cause Americans and the readers, uh, wherever they are, to um, appreciate Madison's contributions to the development of our democratic process. I've long admired Madison more for his work on the Constitution than for his service as president. Uh, and the reason for that, and I want to get to the question in a second, is that I think he institutionalized, in the highest sense, a, the political process, a process of um, accommodation and compromise, uh, one that was more interested in results rather than perfection. And while the constitutional process that he gets so much credit for devising was based on ideas, uh, principles of freedom, liberty, justice, uh, they were not ideologically driven. And where we seem to be today is that so many of our uh, participants in the political process are interested in ideas, but they are ideologically driven, which breaks down, it seems, uh, this process of accommodation and compromise. I'd be interested in your assessment of that view. Well, one thing um, that struck me uh, after being immersed in Madison is that there, there are many issues on which he will he'll split the difference and he'll, and he'll also change his, his emphases. There's some where he never does. Uh, there's an ideological side to James Madison. I mentioned freedom of religion. Uh, he was also a lifelong Anglophobe, lifelong, lifelong Francophile. I mean, it starts when France is a monarchy, it continues when France is a republic. He's a lifelong expansionist. He, he's always thinking how to push America west and also how to get Florida. He's always thinking about those things, how to get the Mississippi Valley, how to go beyond that, how to get Florida. He is a lifelong believer in commercial warfare. 
He thinks that's preferable always to military action, and he believes in its efficacy. You know, the embargo, which was the great venture of Jefferson's second term as president, is really Madison's child. I mean, Jefferson, it was his policy, but I think Madison was the real engine behind it. And when Jefferson is despairing, you know, Jefferson gets such terrible migraines that he basically stops working as president. He says in November of 08, well, I'm going to be leaving anyway, so I'm just not going to do anything. For the, and the presidency then, it lasted till March, not January. So. But Madison, Madison never budges on the embargo, never. And he even thinks of bringing it back when he's president. So uh, yes, he's, you know, he's a legislator. He's a committee man. Uh, he's a work along with people guy. He does all of that. But, but sometimes if you push, push James Madison, I mean, he will, he will push back hard. And uh, I guess you have to say you have to look at those issues on which he was like that and choose among them. Because some of them, such as um, religious liberty, we're glad he pushed hard. Others, anglophobia, maybe not so much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.